Uh, he's the author of Working the Boundaries, Race, Space, and Illegality in Mexican Chicago, co-author of Latino Crossings, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and the Politics of Race and Citizenship, editor of Racial Transformations, Latinos and Asians Remaking the United States in 2006, co-editor of the Deportation Regime, Sovereignty, Space, and the Freedom of Movement, 2010, editor of the Borders of Quote Unquote Europe, Autonomy of Migration, Tactics of Bordering, co-editor of Roma Migrants in the European Union, Unfree Mobility, 2019, and co-editor uh, of Europe Crisis, uh, Noves Palabras Clavas on Lo Crisis, and Europe. excuse my uh, reading and pronunciation and lack of knowledge of uh, Spanish, 2021. Um, we are very happy that you are with us, uh, Nick, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, Aisha, and um, thank you to all the organizers. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be with everyone today. Um, with no further ado, I will um, share my screen. Yes. Okay. And does that look good? Okay. So, border policing and militarization migrant detention, immigration enforcement, and deportation are reaction formations of state power. They involve the material and practical organization of tactics and techniques of control, but they arise always in response to a prior fact of human mobility. Rather than seeing these ever more devious and violent formations of state power as if they were purely a matter of control, therefore, it's instructive, I think, to situate this economy of power in relation to the primacy, autonomy, and subjectivity of human mobility on a global, transnational, intercontinental, cross-border, post-colonial scale. The primacy of autonomy and subjectivity is true, I would contend, as much for refugees as for those who come to be derisively designated to be mere migrants. If we start from the human freedom of movement and recognize the various tactics of bordering as reaction formations, then the various tactics of border policing and forms of migration governance can be seen to introduce interruptions that temporarily immobilize and decelerate human cross-border mobilities with the aim of subjecting them to processes of surveillance and adjudication. Of course, these state tactics are also sometimes deployed to stop and reverse migratory movement. It's clear. Violent pushbacks at borders, deportations, and other types of expulsion, notably, should be recognized as veritable forms of so-called forced migration. Indeed, these coercive measures that impel people across borders are arguably the purest examples of forced migration. This larger dialectic between human mobility and the forces arrayed to govern it reconstitutes these heterogeneous formations of mobility as something that comes to be apprehensible and classifiable alternately as quote unquote migration or quote unquote asylum seeking or forced migration. Uh, on the part of refugees in flight from persecution or violence, which is to say it makes apprehensible and classifiable one or another variety of target and object of government. In other words, the very distinctions that we customarily use 
to mark the difference between migrants and refugees or between migration and forced migration are themselves principally governmental contrivances that serve above all else to subdue and discipline human mobility into legible and manageable categories. There is therefore a permanent epistemic instability within the government of transnational human mobility, which itself relies upon the exercise of a power over classifying, naming, and partitioning migrants and refugees, and the more general multiplication of subtle nuances and contradictions among the categories that regiment mobility. Indeed, such a proliferation arises as an inescapable effect of the multifarious reasons and entangled predicaments that motivate or compel people to move across state borders. Simply put, refugees never cease to have aspirations and against the dominant tendency to figure them as pure victims and thus as the passive objects of the compassion or pity or protection of others, they remain subjects who make more or less calculated strategic and tactical choices about how to reconfigure their lives and advance their life projects despite the dispossession and dislocation of their refugee condition. And likewise, migrants are often in flight. They're fleeing from various social or political conditions that they've come to deem intolerable, uh, thereby actively escaping or deserting forms of everyday deprivation, persecution, or structural violence that, they, that may be no less pernicious for the simple fact that it is mundane. In other words, many migrants may themselves feel absolutely compelled to undertake their journeys and are often inclined to understand their mobility as veritable cases of forced migration, even as they nevertheless exude tremendously strategic subjective dispositions toward their own migratory projects. Hence the labels, quotes migrant or quotes refugee, commonly remain suspended in a state of tension and ambiguity and may only be sorted into neat and clean distinctions or separated by hermetically sealed partitions through more or less heavy handed governmental interventions. Furthermore, it's imperative to underscore once again that the multiple formations of violence that comprise border regimes themselves increasingly convert the humble act of unauthorized border crossing into a life-threatening endurance test, thereby often contributing to desperate forms of flight and arguably producing refugees. Yet even under the most restricted circumstances and under considerable constraint, these human mobilities exude a substantial degree of autonomous subjectivity, whereby migrants and refugees struggle to appropriate mobility and realize their migratory projects. Thus, even against the considerable forces aligned to immobilize and immobilize their movement or to subject them to the stringent and exclusionary rules and constrictions of asylum, the subjective autonomy of human mobility remains an incorrigible force. In my talk today, I would like to consider some examples of how the government or management of like to consider some examples of how the government or management of the COVID-19 pandemic over the last year has manifested itself in various specific instances of the government or management of migration through state tactics of rebordering. By rebordering, I have in mind the variety of tactics and technologies deployed by states to revise and reconfigure how they produce borders and therefore also how they continue reproducing them, how they maintain and sustain borders, how they enforce borders and reinforce them. That is to say, I understand borders not to be fixed and objective realities, not inert things, but instead to be the effects of deliberate and purposeful activity. The products, in other words, of work. Hence, the efforts of states to manage or govern the COVID public, public health emergency have become substantially entangled with the ongoing work of producing and enforcing 
borders and thus on a global scale, the public health crisis has been converted into various spectacles of ostensible border crisis. Importantly, these recent border enforcement spectacles provide important instances where state tactics and techniques of control aimed at blocking and immobilizing migrant and refugee mobilities through detention and other forms of containment or entrapment always remain tentative and tenuous intermissions. Moreover, at times, such interruptions also become occasions for the coercive and occasionally violent remobilization of those same formations of human mobility through diversionary tactics that reroute them or through deportation regimes that literally force migrants and refugees into renewed movement, either by returning them to their points of origin, uh, but increasingly dislocating them to altogether new and unforeseen destinations, however temporary. On a global scale, states have largely seized upon the public health crisis as a pretext and as an opportunity for implementing or intensifying draconian controls at their borders, resorting to a simple-minded logic of quote-unquote national quarantine to justify violent border closures and often vicious tactics of migrant and refugee immobilization more generally. According to the International Organization for Migration, the IOM, at least 174 countries had implemented travel bans, border closures, and other mobility restrictions to contain and mitigate the pandemic, totaling a minimum of 33,712 restrictions as of March 23rd of last year. With the rising panic around the COVID pandemic, therefore the perceived problem of migration uh, and illegalized migrant and refugee movements in particular staged as spectacles of unauthorized border crossing very predictably came to be reframed as a contagion of suspect, unruly, unwashed bodies, presumptive carriers of infectious diseases and vectors of an uncontrolled transmission of the ghoulish virus. The frequently racialized equation of border crossing quote unquote foreigners with the putative threat of contagion is nothing new, of course. Nonetheless, like the coronavirus itself, migrants and refugees have been depicted as a disruptive and dangerous menace that somehow intrudes from the outside, uh, from outside the presumptively self-contained space of each nation state and triggers a simplistic and often cruel logic of implausible insularity and self-isolation in the guise of public health precautions. Thus the feckless bordering of the, of the pandemic has served to unleash a pandemic of viral borders. Declaring a COVID public health emergency as its pretext, the United States under the Trump administration summarily suspended the consideration of virtually all asylum petitions at land borders, relying on an obscure 1944 statute by which the government authorizes itself to block the entry or otherwise expel migrants and refugees purported to be public health threats, uh, the director of the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued an order barring the entry of asylum seekers and others arriving at the border without prior authorization to enter. The Centers for Disease Control has nevertheless admitted that closing the border does not effectively safeguard public health. This measure was coupled with the enforcement of a pushback provision that had been introduced prior to the pandemic in, in 2019 that compelled asylum seekers awaiting hearings to quote unquote, remain in Mexico where they were stranded in overburdened reception facilities and hostels until their cases might eventually come up for review. With a treacherous Orwellian irony, this policy was officially named the Migrant Protection Protocols, even as it subjected asylum petitioners to due process violations, family separations, extortion, and kidnapping. Approximately 30,000 of these asylum seekers who were forced to quote unquote remain in Mexico and were never able to attend their court hearings, furthermore, were deported in absentia. Such measures 
have not only made a travesty of the very pretense of upholding any, any ostensible obligation to offer asylum, but also ensured that these asylum seekers now rebranded officially as deportees would suffer far more severe punitive repercussions if they were ever apprehended as quote unquote illegal migrants upon re-entry to the United States. Due to the, due to the pandemic, moreover, after March 18th of last year, all asylum hearings were indefinitely suspended in the United States, leaving everyone stuck in Mexico in a condition of protracted waiting and torturous uncertainty with no relief in view. While commonly confined to overcrowded, unsanitary circumstances that directly exposed them to a radically heightened risk of COVID infection. Simultaneously, the United States introduced the cynical contrivance whereby the same Central American countries from which most asylum seekers arriving at the US-Mexico border had fled would be designated safe third countries for purposes of deporting asylum seekers who had fled violence or persecution in neighboring Central American countries. Hence, Guatemalans and Salvadorans would be dumped in Honduras, while Hondurans and Salvadorans could similarly be dumped in Guatemala and so forth. Thus, the United States imposed upon its junior partners in the region to accept and detain the asylum seekers who could not otherwise be refouled to the neighboring states from which they often claimed to be fleeing for their lives, but they would thereafter be deported and indefinitely imprisoned in other countries labeled as safe third countries, but deemed unsafe by many of their own ostensible citizens. In other instances, the US deported unaccompanied Central American miners to Mexico, callously abandoning them in a country where they had no familial or social ties and no prospective sources of material or legal support. Likewise, the United States accelerated the more general expulsion of any migrants or refugees already in custody, forcibly returning many who were later found to be COVID positive upon arrival in the countries to which they were deported. Thus, the accelerated US deportation regime itself came to operate very predictably as a devious vehicle for the reckless international transmission and proliferation of the virus. Of course, these long and circuitous detours are likely to eventually amount to extended and arduous forms by which migrants and refugees are trapped or contained within their own mobility and have their migratory itineraries significantly prolonged and diverted to altogether unforeseen destinations en route. Nonetheless, the probable cumulative effect for many will have been that their actual migrations are interrupted and decelerated, but not halted or reversed. In this respect, whole countries and indeed multi-country corridors of migratory transit are converted into de facto open air detention camps in the very crucial sense that they introduce interruptions that decelerate the momentum of migrant mobilities, but ultimately they commonly do not necessarily stop or reverse migration. This is especially visible when we consider the detention camps that have proliferated in border zones where migrants and refugees who are in transit must wait to stage their next cross-border movements. Detention camps that have arisen as statist solutions quote unquote, to the self-organized migrant and refugee camps where people plan their attempts to autonomously cross the next frontier, as in such places as Calais, at the French entrance to the tunnel that crosses the English Channel, or Gurugu, the mountain in Morocco just outside of the Spanish enclave of Melilla, uh, which have been very long-standing self-organized migrant sites for staging border crossings, or more short-lived sites, such as the Edomeni camp at Greece's border with Macedonia during the height of Europe's so-called migrant crisis in 2015, or the camps in Serbia, where thousands gathered in the ensuing years in the hope of crossing into Hungary. But this process of deceleration is also evident in the de facto detention of newly arrived migrants and refugees in remote so-called reception centers, where asylum seekers may even be free to come and go and finally are free to leave altogether and disappear into migrant illegality, but are otherwise sequestered by receiving states in remote locales, far from any practical means of recommencing their migratory journeys. 
frequently then, particularly under circumstances that do not culminate in outright deportations, detention in its various forms serves to interrupt migratory movement temporarily instead of halting it, operating in effect as decompression chambers. Hence, there are migrants and refugees who in one way or another get stranded or stuck, temporarily immobilized en route, uh, whether they get blocked at border crossing sites or pushed back and contained in makeshift self-organized border zone camps or in shelters or hostels operated by charities, humanitarian NGOs or solidarity organizations who must wait out the border regime, hoping to eventually prevail in their mobility projects. In such examples, it is crucial to see that these standby tactics of migrant and refugee autonomy and their counterpart uh, and their counterpart in the detention facilities of various states' border regimes, where migration is coercively stalled, are indeed not so much simple examples of exclusion in any pure sense, as they serve to modulate the terms and conditions of a kind of subordinate inclusion that is first of all instigated by the autonomy and sheer determination of the migrants themselves. And these forms of temporarily prolonging the migratory process through tactics of interruption and deceleration seemed to be seem to be similarly evident when states deport migrants to states other than their countries of origin, as in the recent efforts of the United States that I've just described, but also as has been done for years in the deportion deportations from North African countries of African migrants and refugees aspiring to reach Europe to spaces of abandonment at the southern edge of the Sahara, particularly in Mali. Notably, in the context of the deportation dragnets and mass expulsions of migrants enforced in response to the COVID pandemic, the equation of migrants with contagion has sometimes also characterized the sending state's reaction against returning migrants or deportees, where they are similarly figured as invasive and unwelcome external vectors of disease and viral transmission and thereby rebranded as unwelcome migrants, quote unquote, even in their countries of origin and presumptive citizenship. Hence, during the pandemic, migrants have been increasingly challenged by a double process of rebordering by both sending and receiving states, driven by the false and ultimately futile logic of preemptive and punitive exclusion, commonly leaving the migrants trapped in protracted and indefinite transit all the while exposed to heightened risks of exposure and infection. From the standpoint of public health, of course, this is plainly a self-defeating strategy that merely multiplies the conditions of possibility for the virus to spread. But it underscores the extent to which a neo-Malthusian public health rationality mercilessly, mercilessly subjects some lives to a statist calculus whereby those human lives are deemed to be expendable and may be disregarded and discounted as affordable deaths. But for those who survive these travails, the renewal of their migrations frequently becomes all the more urgent and necessary as the only reasonable remedy to their quote unquote failed migratory projects. From the US-Mexico border, to Mexico's southern border and multiple borders across Central America, to the self-organized migrant camps at Calais, to the European Union's hotspot reception and detention camps in Italy and Greece, to Australia's island prison camps for asylum seekers on Manus and Nauru in the, in the South Pacific. Migrants and refugees' predicaments of being stalled, waiting, strategizing, and biding their time represent a whole spectrum of differing degrees of being on standby. From coercive dislocation and confinement to more amorphous forms of containment, including being contained within their own unfinished mobility projects. And of course, for many, during such periods of indefinite waiting and uncertainty, they're frequently relegated to a condition of protracted unemployment and marginalization, even abject destitution. These circumstances 
are part of a larger process of precaritization that systematically disciplines migrants and refugees into their ultimate socio-political condition of disposability as labor. Their eventual disposability as labor, however, must be first predicated on the material and practical enforcement of the disposability of their lives. This is amply evident in an exaggerated way in the context of the COVID pandemic, where overcrowding and unsanitary conditions directly multiplies the risk of infection and the potential for death. Through such mercenary exercises in putative prophylaxis on the pretext of protecting the public health of their citizens, state tactics of rebordering in the face of the pandemic can appropriately be characterized as a verification of what Ashil Mbembe has called the necropolitics of state sovereignty for which the material destruction of human bodies and populations remains a central project. The often brutal tendencies of these border regimes have plainly exposed migrants and refugees to an inordinate risk of COVID infection as border closures have interdicted and confined migrants in overcrowded and unsanitary migrant detention prisons with no provision of adequate health care. The most infamous example of this predicament is, of course, uh, the Moria detention camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. Originally designated to have the capacity to house a maximum of 3,000 migrants and refugees, long foreseen to be the very predictable scene of an impending humanitarian catastrophe, the camp's population had at times swollen to more than 20,000. By September of 2020, the notorious so-called reception center, first created as an emergency so-called hotspot for the supposedly speedy registration of newly arriving asylum seekers in 2015, was estimated to contain a population of 13,000 people. As Europe's largest refugee camp, Moria, was overwhelmingly populated by people who had fled dangerous conflict zones with a very large number of families with children, as well as hundreds of unaccompanied minors, trapped indefinitely by the cynical stalemate of a European asylum system that would not process and resettle them elsewhere across the European Union in outrageously overcrowded and squalid conditions, and now in the midst of the uncontrolled pandemic. Under circumstances that remain controversial and somewhat opaque, the Moria camp was burnt down on September 8th through 10th of 2020 in a series of arson fires. The fires quickly ignited portable gas canisters used for cooking and devastated the camp completely. The fires were variously attributed to either the desperation and exasperation of the migrant inmates of the camp protesting the severe medical lockdown restrictions imposed on them by camp authorities after, after the discovery of 35 positive COVID cases and the more general mismanagement of the pandemic, or alternately were attributed, uh, were believed to be the wanton handiwork of local Greek fascists exploiting the situation or not implausibly attributed to both causes. Virtually the entire resident population of migrants and refugees were violently blocked from entering the nearest village by armed bands of hostile Greek residents who also created roadblocks to impede the passage of emergency medical teams and even the Greek military personnel seeking to reach the burned out disaster site to provide relief. Thus the newly homeless camp residents were summarily left abandoned to sleep and camp out on the remote rural roadsides. Meanwhile, even while Moria burned, Greek coast guards policing the maritime border were engaged in illegal pushbacks on the Aegean Sea, interdicting unseaworthy migrant boats and rafts and forcibly dragging them and abandoning them on the open sea in Turkish waters. The specifically necropolitical dimension of all bordering is abundantly manifest whenever migrants' lives are effectively deemed to be disposable, whereby migrants, particularly those who are illegalized and rejected refugees, are systematically and disproportionately relegated to conditions that enforce a greater likelihood of their premature deaths. <clears throat> 
However, this presumptive expendability of migrants' lives is inseparable from the larger configuration of forces that render them to be eminently disposable labor. Here we must recall that Foucault's well-known proposition of the concept of biopolitics, which designates a modern form of power that responds to a general injunction to cultivate life, to make live, as he puts it, is always accompanied by the concomitant prerogative to let die. In this respect, it's always crucial to not apprehend the, uh, the necropolitics of borders and migration regimes in a one-sided way as a purely exclusionary impulse and instead to see the systemic production of border violence and death as intrinsic to the larger biopolitics of these regimes, which produce and regulate illegalized migrants' lives in order to ensure their subordinate inclusion. It is in this regard that we are repeatedly confronted with the apparent paradox that the very same illegalized migrants and rejected refugees castigated as quote unquote undesirable menaces once they've made their way across these violent and lethal border scapes are also not infrequently later deemed to be essential workers whose very disposability renders them indispensable to various well-established labor regimes that routinely satisfy the demands of capital accumulation. Even confronted with the ever more devious and deadly reaction formations of border policing and immigration enforcement by state powers, the constitutive force and autonomy of human mobility must nonetheless be central in our analyses of the veritable making and remaking of our contemporary world, particularly under the restrictions imposed by states during the pandemic, it is abundantly evident that migratory projects and itineraries have been subjected to often violent reversals as a result of border closures, increasingly militarized border control, more heavy handed detention regimes and intensified deportation dragnets. Nonetheless, even under the most repressive conditions and confronted with such cruel reversals, it remains vital to discern the autonomous force and subjective versatility of migrants and refugees who continually recalibrate their own strategies and tactics in the agonistic effort to realize their mobility projects. Even against the considerable forces aligned to immobilize their migratory projects, which may to greater or lesser extents compel them to revert to a kind of standby mode, migrants' subjective autonomy remains an incorrigible force. And waiting to be reactivated, their mobilities remain an intractable and always potentially disruptive constitutive power. The autonomy of migration is inherently and objectively political. Inasmuch as migrants and refugees can be understood to be to act in a manner that asserts the primacy of their human needs over and against the border, over and against the police and the law and the state. This is objectively the case, regardless of whatever ideas that any given migrant may have formulated consciously or articulated. Just think of the thousands of refugees on the march across Europe in 2015, charging one border after another. Or think of the caravans of hundreds, if not thousands, of Central Americans who arrived at the US-Mexico border in 2018, triumphantly scaling the border fence in a celebration of their defiance with the idea of a politics of incorrigibility, I have sought to highlight not only the objective intractability of migrant subjectivity within the workings of border regimes that seek to manage or govern human mobility, but also in such moments of deliberate disaffection and defiance. I designate this as a politics of incorrigibility, moreover, because it confronts state power and its border immigration and asylum regimes with the impossibility of changing or correcting the abject excess that its own system of illegalization has generated and sustained. Proponents of the autonomy of migration perspective to which my own work has contributed 
have frequently advanced the proposition that migration itself can be understood to be a social movement in an objective sense. In the American context, the recurrent mass caravans of recent years, composed of migrants and refugees, mainly Honduran and other Central American women, children, unaccompanied minors, and LGBT persons, signal an increasingly prominent example of such migrant autonomy and collective self-organization as a veritable social movement. These mobilizations have been a repeated and persistent occurrence over the last decade or more, organized more or less annually by the Transnational Migrant Solidarity Organization, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, often in the run-up to the Easter Sunday holiday to evoke the Via Crucis, the way of the cross associated with the biblical narrative of the passion of Jesus. The caravans provide a model of collective organized migrant and refugee self-protection against the predations of the migrant journey, as well as an affirmative protest mobilization against unjust border and immigration policies. It's crucial to note, however, that a very large portion of these are people fleeing violence in numerous forms, including state repression, as well as disasters associated with climate change, and they aspire to petition for asylum. This is precisely the sort of humble, but nonetheless audacious, refugee self-assertion and self-organization that I, with Glenda Garelli and uh, Martina Tazzioli, have called the autonomy of asylum. In this perspective, the questions of asylum, including the stringent and exclusionary juridical provisions for refugee recognition and protection, and the hegemonic narratives of victimization, persecution, and forced migration, must be rendered apprehensible and commensurate with the irreducibility of refugees constrained, but nonetheless substantial autonomy, their freedom of movement, their subjectivity, whereby asylum seekers petition for protection and at the same time refuse to accept the spatial traps and restrictions imposed by the asylum regime's rules of the game. The mass caravans, of asylum seekers whose collective mobilization defies the customary and obligatory narratives, constructing them as pure victims, repudiate and often defy the hegemonic expectations that bona fide and legitimate refugees could only ever be the objects of someone else's pity and compassion and protection, and instead affirm and boldly assert their own subjectivity and autonomy. At the start of 2021, the first major caravan since the COVID outbreak was on the march. Originating in the Honduran city of San Pedro Sula in the aftermath of the combined economic and social devastation of the pandemic, and then two back-to-back -back hurricanes in November, but also as a more general repudiation of the violence, corruption, and impunity of the Honduran state, the caravan went on the march. Now I'm going to ask you for your forbearance for a moment as I pause and uh, retrieve some pages of my talk that are missing. I'll be right back. Apologize for this unforeseen haphazard interruption, but interruptions have indeed been part of my theme today. 
see. Okay, I apologize. So, so these in this caravan, as all the caravans, have been not only responses to particular events such as the hurricanes or indeed the pandemic, but a more general repudiation of the violence, corruption, and impunity of the Honduran state, as well as societal violence and endemic poverty. Uh, in January, this was perhaps the largest, perhaps the largest caravan to date, with estimates ranging from seven to 9,000 participants. Upon crossing the border into Guatemala, the migrants and refugees were, were met with a militarized response that culminated on January 17th of 2021, just a couple of months ago, in a fierce assault by state security forces wielding crude wooden truncheons hewn from tree branches and deploying tear gas, citing the requirement that no one can be granted entry into the country without proof of a negative COVID test, the Guatemalan authorities justified their violent reaction on the basis of quote unquote national security, citing the risk of mass contagion and also criminalizing the caravan with the allegation that it was infiltrated by gang members. A viral border indeed. In fact, just, over, just, uh, just under two weeks ago, the president of Guatemala instituted new emergency measures to establish once again, a state of prevention along the border with Honduras amidst rumors of a new caravan taking formation. If the pandemic supplies the pretext for this convulsion of reactive and reactionary militarized border policing, however, the deeper infrastructure sustaining this extravagant and brutal response lies in the subcontracting of junior partner states, such as Mexico or Guatemala, to serve as de facto border guards in what is effectively an externalization of the United States' border regime across the full extent of Mexico, Central America, and beyond. For at least the last two decades, the United States has persistently deployed its economic power and political force in order to exert pressure and ex inexorably enlist and command the compliance of other states across the Americas to marshal their border control, detention, and deportation capabilities toward the ends of intensifying the punitive repercussions for autonomous cross-border human mobility. During the same era, the European Union has pursued an analogous strategy in its, in its own extended so-called neighborhood of externalized bordering from Turkey and North Africa to deep into Sub-Saharan Africa. In these ways, state powers in the so-called global North also conveniently outsource the most cruel violence of their own border regimes to more overtly, quote unquote, illiberal states that operate with fewer pretensions of humanitarianism and greater levels of impunity. This finally is a crucial dimension of a larger underlying dynamic. That the COVID pandemic helps to elucidate. The frenzy of rebordering instigated in the face of the pandemic has served in fact to unleash a veritable pandemic of viral borders. An infectious and highly promiscuous contagion of border policing tactics that is spread with a viral velocity and ferocity. However, this viral, this viral spread of rebordering has not been occasioned by a random or sporadic sequence of haphazard interactions and exchanges, but rather by the steady, predictable, and largely systematic integration and consolidation of border regimes that exceed the limits and constraints of any single nation state's sovereignty 
or territorial jurisdiction. This, of course, is not to suggest that these border regimes are somehow not riddled with their own contradictions and conflicts, but it does nonetheless underscore their transnational intercontinental geopolitical scope. And indeed, those conflicts and contradictions represent a kind of harmonization on a larger scale. The differences that borders produce, furthermore, create the conditions for the violence, degradation, and indeed racial subjugation of many migrants and refugees as effectively subhuman. And this is especially pronounced in contexts where migrants from the world's poorer, formerly colonized countries aspire to transgress the borders of the richest countries. Those richest countries, of course, are the imperial, uh, imperial or formerly colonialist countries whose wealth, power, and prestige were accumulated on the basis of long histories of conquest, pillage, and exploitation, precisely in those countries from which an inordinate number of migrants and refugees come. In this respect, we can understand contemporary migration as a key site where our global post-colonial condition is realized and made manifest. And likewise, both the proliferation of borders on a planetary scale and the increasing consolidation of supranational border regimes, which encompass and integrate multiple states, emerge as contemporary sites for staging the unfinished business and open-ended struggles over this global post-colonial condition. In all of this, however, the proliferation and fortification and re-entrenchment of borders remains fundamentally a reaction formation responding always to the primacy and subjective force of human mobility and the elementary exercise of our existential freedom of movement. And the transnational intercontinental geopolitical scope of these border regimes is indeed a kind of inverted reflection of the truly global character of these formations of human mobility themselves. This is what the caravans illustrate in a resplendent way. The autonomy of migration and refugee movements repeatedly presents itself as an obstreperous subjective force, and indeed a pronouncedly post-colonial reprise, enacting various configurations of human life in its active productive relation to the space of the planet, and thereby reasserting the primacy of human life as a mobile constituent power in itself. The migrant politics of incorrigibility then is radically open-ended as in the mass migrant protest mobilizations of 2006 across the United States, such a politics of incorrigibility is well expressed in the chant, aquí estamos y no nos vamos, y si nos sacan, nos regresamos. Here we are and we're not leaving. And if you throw us out, we'll come right back. In effect, Migrants in such moments not only defy the system, but also confront it with its own irreconcilable contradictions and dysfunction. The millions who rallied and marched in those mobilizations were effectively saying, not only here we are then, but also where do we go from here? By implication, the migrant politics of incorrigibility boldly articulates the contentious insistence that another world must be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe we could stop stop sharing the slides. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we have uh, several questions, but um, thank you very much for also kind of a. Um, in a way, bringing an a detour um, over of your work that, in terms of with the post-colonial condition, which I had all uh, forgotten at the beginning to mention that that uh, migration 
and the post-coloniality, that connection uh, was very central to your work. And I think this is very crucial and this is very dear to the Europe Asia research platform too. And, uh, and uh, how you brought the, um, the dynamics, contradictions and politics of autonomy of migration in the context of the COVID-19 where that the uh, fissures have been augmented uh, in a way that re uh, revealed uh, bare open uh, in a way. Thank you very much. I have, um, I have a, uh, I have one question, but I will not give the priority to myself because there are some uh, others. Have, okay, there is a, um, there is one question from um, Constantinos Papas uh, to you. Then I will put myself after. Uh, after uh, him. Um, great presentation. Thank you very much. It is impressive the example of Moria's camp that you mentioned working on migratory refugee flows impact in insular regions. The Greek islands are under my team's uh, binoculars. Allow me to say that I agree with you on the lack of European reaction and policies used to deal with the massive arrival of refugees to European land. Europe and of course Greece, a country that was just coming out of a financial crisis and a 10-year brutal austerity measures found themselves completely unprepared. This is an unfortunate situation, mainly for refugees and migrants arriving at the Greek islands, for the local population and for the country that has been transformed into a sole human repository. However, I have objections on the pushbacks you mentioned by Greek authorities and even Frontex, the European Border Management Agency. In my opinion, the problem is more complex and involves heavily Turkey's regional ambitions. Okay, so um, I think you could, uh, my question was a little bit different uh, sort, so maybe I'm not going to put the questions together. Uh, at least we could start uh, with this one. Mm -hmm. Well, I suspect that this is, um, that this is potentially the tip of an iceberg that could be a very long and, uh, uh, and you know, and involved conversation or debate. Um, I would say, um, I would say that really the larger issue that I understand to be evoked by this question and this comment is the peculiar status of Greece with respect to the European project overall. Um, and so the historic uh, antagonism of Greek nationalism to, um, to the legacy of, of Ottoman Turkish domination uh, the enduring sort of suspicion uh, between Greece and Turkey and the various frictions are all things that have been reanimated and uh, reinvigorated by what was plainly a very cynical move on the part of uh, of um, the Turkish President Erdogan to, you know, uh, flagrantly and very overtly and explicitly open the border um, in order to instigate a border crisis. That much I think is true. Um, the Greek response um, was was really a, a horrific one, um, and continue you know has continued to be, um, including uh, reports of people being stripped of their clothing and marched back across the Turkish border, the land border near Evros, um, uh, naked, um, in the rain and cold. Um, and deprived also of their possessions and uh, and beaten um you know not to mention the use of um of um high speed boats to destabilize uh migrant um you know unseaworthy rafts and and so forth uh, and literally dragging people as i mentioned uh, back into turkish waters and dumping them there um so again what i 
highlight in this context is the autonomy of the migrants. Presented with that opportunity, devious and cynical as it was on the part of the Turkish state to create an opening at the border, uh, people who had been on standby sometimes for years, making their lives in the informal economy uh, within Turkey, uh, sold off everything and moved directly to, to the border to cross into Europe. You know? But the bigger issue, of course, is that crossing into Greece for most of these migrants and refugees coming through Turkey um, is really just an extension of being in Turkey. That is to say, arriving in Greece is not arriving in the Europe that they desire. It's, uh, it's another transit zone. Um, some, of course, may, uh, may opt to stay in Greece, um, you know, or may come to opt to stay in Greece. Uh, but, but of course, for most over the course of these last few years, Greece has simply been one more staging point for the, for the movement further into uh, this kind of um, obscure object of desire imagined as a Europe of promise and opportunity. Right. Um, and so again, it, it underscores the ambivalent relationship of Greece to the larger European project, ambivalent certainly on the part of, of uh, the EU authorities, um, whereby Greece is demoted to a kind of marginal status as a, as a frontline border state that has to prove and demonstrate its deservingness for inclusion within Europe on the basis of its capacity to function effectively as, uh, as a border guard, um, but also Greece's investment in that border violence as a way to verify its own Europeanness. In other words, what I'm interested in critiquing and underscoring is the inherent racism of the European project and, um, you know, and therefore the ways in which a Greek nationalist project that becomes aligned to that European project is itself inherently a, a post-colonial formation, even as Greece resents uh, the kind of historical legacy of Turkey's domination, um, having been itself a colony, right? So this is kind of saying a lot in a way that might need to be further unpacked. But I think that the, I think that the tensions between Greece and Turkey are certainly, um, you know, are certainly a key site where uh, a kind of cultural politics of European identity um, are always at stake in a way that helps us to sort of confront um, European, Euro Europeanness as a racial formation and the European project as a racial formation. Um, again, what's finally at stake is actually uh, the agonistic proposition of whether Greece actually is part of Europe or not. Right? And that is part of what was underscored so frequently by the marginalization of Greece, um, you know, beginning with the economic crisis and then being in a sense of refolded and reconfigured through Greece's dutiful performance as border guard. Um, and that I think, you know, is at stake in a similar way uh, in different moments um, when you see similar processes play out at other places that we could call the borders of Europe. Again, there is no sort of objective there, there. There is no objective Europe as such. It is, it is a project that then, once it approaches its own frontiers, its own margins, its own borders, is also kind of putting into question who can and cannot be counted as European, which countries do and do not count as part of Europe. And that's a continuing ongoing conflict and, and dispute. Um, but again, in, in the larger sort of geopolitical sense and the historical sense, it is about uh, a post-colonial condition of Europe. Um, so that, I mean, I think that's what I would say there. Um, try to keep it as, okay. not oh. quite brief, but uh, as brief as I can. Yes, we have quite a number of uh, questions. And uh, because I have put myself there as there too, that I would like to pose my question. Um, in terms of that, the um, primacy of uh, mobility, that the, from the autonomy, the primacy of the mobility. Um, I have a question in terms of whether we have to put the kind of the primacy there or mobility and the border are mutually, borderings are mutually constituted. 
because when mo movement becomes a mobility is otherwise movement every movement every kind of a movement should be counted and it becomes a kind of a mobility once it encounters a kind of a border so rather than the primacy that uh why can't we say uh, uh it is mutually constituted and once we put it that way and then uh actually from the examples that you have showed and from the history and the COVID also showed us, mobility is never desired to be halted. Mobility is never to be stopped. Mobility is crucial for the creation of value, for the value creation. And if we see it that way as the part of the value regime, then there is an irony actually in terms of valorization of the mobility because mobility is crucial for the capital accumulation so uh i'm trying to uh there is a i mean with the instead of the primacy they're trying to see actually this mobility creates the kind of it is crucial for the kind of the dispossession because it creates that kind of uh, uh, um, affordable debts. It creates as the way that is, it is crucial for the production of the illegalized bodies and labor. So why should we start with the kind of a romanticizing as if that every movement is that uh, there is that kind of a primacy of autonomy of the uh, movement? So that is uh, that is my question. That's a that's a great question, Naisha. Um, and in fact, you know, in fact, I believe that we actually agree. You know, I do think that um, these mobilities and the border regimes that they encounter are mutually constituted. Um, I would put the point somewhat differently. I would say that it's not that they become mobility when they meet the border. I would say that mobility becomes migration when it meets the border. Um, and in that sense, I think we also agree. <laughs> um, I mean, that's to say, that's to say, there are all sorts of forms of human mobility across space, um, but there are only some of them that come to be labeled or branded as migration or as refugee movements. Um, and that has to do with the ways in which they're subjected to the power of a border, right? But again, I think that the border itself is responding to something that's there first, rather than the idea that the border is there in some kind of objective and uh, you know um, innate way. And so, partly, I'm trying to problematize uh, the reification of borders to insist that borders are in fact um, processes of purposeful activity. They are a form of labor. Um, that they are, you know, verbs bordering activities okay. yeah. on the parts of states, and then that's part of that's part of the force of my intervention to to destabilize the reification of borders in, in favor of seeing the process. Um, and again, it's precisely by bordering certain mobilities that certain mobilities get called migration or refugee movements, whereas other ones are crossing the street or moving across town or moving from one town to another within the same uh, nation state space, et cetera. Um, but, um, but uh, and indeed, and indeed the, the border is implicated, as you say, in these kinds of processes of valorization by subjecting certain forms, formations of, of human mobility uh, in particular ways that mediate their construction as, uh, you know, potentially um, different kinds of uh, formations of labor for capital. So I think really in substantive ways, we agree on every point, but I will insist that there's an analytical usefulness to, to, to arguing for the primacy of human mobility. Um, and really that's not in my mind about romanticizing, it's about an analytical necessity that corresponds to the ways in which we, we understand the larger configuration of our contemporary world. That is to say, I believe that labor is primary and capital 
um, you know, capital becomes uh, the objectification and alienation of labor. And it's precisely out of that theoretical, you know, kind of inventory or, or a repository that the concept of the autonomy of migration originates. The autonomy of labor becomes the autonomy of migration. Um, and the insistence on primacy, I think, is really about making an insistence on the primacy of human life. Whether we're talking about labor generally, whether we're talking about migration, it's about the primacy of human life and the creative capacities and productive powers of human life that then come to be objectified and alienated in historically specific ways under one or another social formation or social regime. Um, in, and in that sense, I don't think it's about romanticizing. I think it's about insisting that for us to be able to imagine something that would exceed capitalism, something that could come after, we also have to be able to recognize that something came before, that to imagine the end of capitalism, we have to understand that capitalism had a beginning and that the beginning involved something that came first. And that, what, that thing that came first is indeed the productive power and creative capacity of human life, which we only call labor within the framework of a particular regime of subjection and subordination. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, actually, I was, uh, I was, I'm very much with you in terms of the primacy of life, and and then the also um, labor. But um, uh, in terms of the uh, borders, I was not talking about the kind of the reification. That's why I was always referring as bordering regimes because it could be within the same country. It could be all. I mean, you don't need that kind of reified uh, borders. And then the uh, romanticizing, in a way, in the sense that what I was referring to was in terms of assuming the primacy of a subjectivity. Subjectivity is always, that is, I think this is a kind of a, a differences in terms of the starting points that the subjectivity is a product. That's why I don't want to start with that kind of the, uh, the primacy, but nevertheless, we have a huge list of uh, questions that we could continue our conversations in a different form. Valentina Pluch, are there any countries, governments, NGOs implemented successful approach to deal with and to help awaiting refugees on the borders of their countries? And if not, how do you personally think what would be the best solution independently for governments, NGOs and refugees to cope with current problems of today's forced migrants waiting to be transported to their final destinations because of COVID-19. I will collect a couple of so that you can combine and keep those ones because of uh, time. Please uh, forgive me, uh, the people that who have uh, um, uh, posed the questions. And there is another question from Paula Ponke. Ponte. Okay. My question is, can there be a way in where we can humanize the process immigrants and refugees go through? And, and then there's another one, the third one. So I would, I would put on these three. Dear Nicolas, many thanks for this excellent talk, Daniel Quinteros Rojas. What do you think is or should be the role of international or transnational organizations in producing this particular border regime? So you could combine, you could uh, pick up from those, uh, I mean, uh, ideally all of them. So uh, I will give you the floor with this one uh, and then uh, we will continue. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, these are all, it, it's, the, it's the misfortune of the, the live stream chat format that we have the question, but I don't have the way to, in, in, you know, to interact directly with the, the person asking the question to understand more precisely what exactly the question is aiming for. So sometimes, you know, so sometimes um, a back and forth might, might reveal to me better um, what the person's question, what is the question behind the question, so to speak. So um, these may miss the mark, but, but um, well, this question, uh, this question about how to humanize 
Um, I think, you know, I think that uh, clearly I've described and clearly we all recognize there are many ways in which, um, in which a kind of hostility toward migrants and refugees, uh, you know, sometimes called populism uh, uh, in the US context, more frequently we would refer to it as nativism, anti-immigrant hostility, um, and the very frequently racist character of those of those discursive formations that, that demonize and vilify um, migrants and refugees, uh, of course, are well known to us. Um, so it elicits naturally this question, how to counteract that, how to humanize. Um, again, I think that, um, I, th I think that, um, you know, any, any kind of direct engagement with uh, the migrants and refugees themselves lends itself abundantly to the fact that they, you know, in a certain sense, need not be humanized so much, so much as they are abundantly about the, the primacy of uh, the human needs and, and the willingness of people to put their needs first, right? This is part of the argument I'm making. There's something objectively political about the fact that people are willing to risk their lives and defy borders and defy uh, various formations of border policing. Um, that that is you know that is precisely about the primacy of human needs the prerogative of advancing their life projects and their aspirations to realize their human needs um, against these various formations of violence so in that sense i think you know um you know they need not be more humanized than that 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 is as as <laughs> you know that is ab as abundantly um as abundantly human as uh, as anyone could ask for, and in fact, it underscores the dehumanizing or you know sort of uh, you know racist and violent character of these border regimes. Um, and and you know so in a sense, um, you know that is arguably one of the real virtues also of an ethnographic engagement with these processes um, to actually you know you know to in an intersubjective direct and immediate way to sort of engage with uh, the, the stories and the struggles of people engaged in these, um, these movements uh, in the double sense of the word, both as literal mobilities, but also uh, struggles, um, social and political movements that we can associate with migration, I think, um, you know, becomes an important way um, to counteract um, these very kind of ultimately shallow and devious kinds of representations of them as a threat or as other kinds of um, problems, so to speak. Um, you know, the other questions about international organizations and what role they might play. And I mean, I, again, I'm not sure um, if the question is understood at the level of kind of you know, sort of international humanitarianism or other sorts of organizations. But what we see in part is that these border regimes are composed not only of state powers uh, policing their borders, but a whole variety of different kinds of actors, ranging from NGOs of various kinds, solidarity movement, uh, activist involvement, advocacy, humanitarian organizations, and also smugglers and <laughs> organized crime organizations and any variety of different kinds of actors who are all in a sense contenders for some form of sovereignty um, within these processes. And, um, and I think that's one of the useful, that's the usefulness in the sense of the concept of a border regime that exceeds a merely a narrowly statist kind of understanding of what's at stake in, in that dialectic at the border. Um, so we see many different kinds of actors, international organizations of various kinds. Um, and of course, um, my sympathies or, or my sort of enthusiasm would be for the ways in which people can be engaged in solidarity work with migrants and refugees directly in ways that oftentimes, again, uh, um, are a reflection or a response to what is indeed the activism of the migrants and refugees themselves. So one of the pitfalls and one of the dangers is a notion of solidarity activism that reinscribes that kind of partition of the sort of white savior uh, 
uh, the European uh, or other kind of white, um, you know, do-gooder who is there to act in solidarity to kind of rescue people um, who are again refashioned as the objects of their compassion or pity or indeed solidarity. Uh, and, and in fact, the people most dedicated to their own, to their protection as refugees or migrants are the migrants and refugees themselves. So, so in that way, there are important contradictions also, even at the level of solidarity organiza organizations um, that, that kind of move into border settings and try in one way or another to facilitate and support um, the border crossing efforts of migrants and refugees. Um, but again, at the level of kind of uh, at the level of kind of international super state governance, which would be the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is that, is that there are ways in which uh, a certain kind of humanitarian rationality um, has kind of come to vie with, uh, to vie for sovereignty in competition with national states. Sometimes those things are you know, very awkwardly at odds with one another and antagonistic, but many times indeed um, that super state international harmonization of these things um, becomes an expression of uh, a kind of sovereign power that, um, that has a quasi imperial character, right? So precisely in the ways that imperial or colonial empires may have presumed to be engaged in uh, a kind of global management that exceeded any one particular state or nation. Um, you know, you now have in the post-colonial era, the sort of increasing prominence of international organizations um, that at times will sort of castigate one or another state actor as a bad actor, you know, but, uh, um, but at the same time, create frameworks for global governance in which someone has to ultimately be an enforcer, right? So it's precisely that humanitarian logic that then has served the ends of reinforcing or reconfiguring various formations of imperial power, um, you know, in ways that dissimulate. Uh, and here, of course, I have in mind specifically, above all the United States, which has used certain kinds of humanitarian uh, rationales to justify the invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq and, and so on. Um, so, I mean, so it's a complex issue, but one where I feel that um, we should not have a naive faith that international organizations in that super state form of global governance uh, offer a remedy in any straightforward way. Um, and then I, I guess just, uh, I'm not sure about the question about the first question. Um, I'm not sure what the question is exactly, but but if I understood correctly, it was sort of asking, are there good examples, <laughs> to put it very crudely, are there good examples of um, how people are managing these um, kind of border situations? And and you know, and um, and it would be a bit um, too brusque of me to simply say I'm not aware of any. <laughs> on the other hand, um, because I have a deep suspicion about state power in you know in all of its guises and the ways in which borders are you know sort of maintained and and uh, reproduced and reinforced, even when they appear to be functioning in a relatively um, in a relatively humane or liberal fashion. For example, um, under the uh, under the political under, under the government of uh, Korea, the government of Ecuador announced a policy that said they would uh, recognize universal citizenship and allow everyone to travel to Ecuador with no visa. What, of course, that meant within the larger framework of these dynamics that I've been describing of a migratory corridor extending from the U.S. through Mexico and Central America, in fact, down into South America is uh, is the creation of is the creation of a framework whereby Ecuador became a kind of uh, a kind of smuggler state. It became a it, it became a platform for various kinds of smuggling operations, whereby people started to arrive in Ecuador from all over the world, from Syria, from Bangladesh, from Nigeria, or what have you, um, in order to find their way into those corridors. Um, of migration 
to get to the United States. And so well-established smuggling operations, uh, historically oriented to Ecuadorians based in Ecuador became a framework for uh, a gathering and a kind of platform for mobilizing uh, illegalized migrations um, toward the United States, even when the state was ostensibly introducing what seemed like a radically liberal um, kind of opening for people. Um, and indeed, you know, one, one looks a, when one looks closer, one discovers that um, certain groups thereafter, even though they were supposedly welcomed as visa-free travelers, um, you know, came to be effectively illegalized in any case. So I think in, you know, there are examples that could be examined upon closer examination. My, my suspicion is that they, they can only be understood not in isolation, but as part of these larger dynamics. And so there's a much bigger question um, about the global geopolitics of human mobility that's at stake here. Okay, um, because of time, I'm gonna really put several questions in from them. Um, you're free to uh, combine them or choose whatever you would like to respond because uh, really we have several questions and please uh, those of you whose questions could not be posed, uh, forgive us. One is, um, thank you for the very interesting talk. So the logics of detention of immigrants reminds quite heavily on the logics of detention as we know it from colonial times and the transatlantic slave trade. Official slavery operated by cent for centuries. Do you think this detention system labeling and spacing them and make them subhumans will also remain for centuries now. And then there is, uh, this was from Anja Ringhofer. There is another one from Birgül Yilmaz. Hello, Nicholas and Aisha. I have a question. How do you conceptualize immobility infrastructure, please? So this is uh, another one from uh, Müge Dalkiran. Uh, I know that she works on Moira. She had worked on Moira. Thank you for your presentation. Last year, after Turkey opened its borders and migrants crossed to the Greek islands, some of them were kept in a big ferry and they were not allowed to step in hotspots, which were initially designed as an emergency and temporary areas for asylum applications. How would you comment on this response that the asylum seekers were kept in even more containment? space flowing on the sea and not allowing them to arrive in the hotspots to seek for asylum. What does it say to us about the sustainability of the EU's emergency response when it is challenged by another emergency situation? And I think that also opens up a very interesting way of that how seas acquire a particular positionality in these the uh, different regimes of detention and uh, bordering and flows actually, letting in and uh, out. And there is another one that I would like to put, um, yes by Shristi uh, Sati. Thank you for your presentation. I would appreciate some elaboration on conceptualizing a border management program, especially in post-colonial states, wherein cities and villages on either side of the international border have ancestral linkages and shared traditions, but it becomes complex when the two nations have unstable bilateral relations historically and in contemporary global politics. I'm speaking from the context of South Asia, where my own research work is based at the India-Pakistan frontiers. So I think, and then the last one is, um, uh, this is um, 
uh, Eugenia Blasetti. In this sense, do you think that NGOs operating the Mediterranean through search and rescue operations could be defined and understood through the concept of solidarity activism and therefore supporting migrant subjectivity? Or do they somehow reproduce the white saver paradigm, therefore perpetuating asymmetrical relationships with migrants? And I think we, this is the, um, given the time, I think this is what we could take now. I mean, really uh, choose, uh, have your picks. <laughs> That's it. These are great questions, but. They are great questions. They're five very big questions and um, I'm afraid we won't do justice to them, but. Um, but thank you everyone for these questions and it's useful I think even to share them and articulate them even if we don't get a chance to fully discuss them because they're very provocative and, and thoughtful questions. Um, I'll start maybe with um, with this uh, example of a, a ferry uh, mm -hmm. where migrants and refugees um, were effectively put into detention. Um, uh, so the ferry, in, in the example, you know, the ferry um, became a kind of floating detention camp or detention prison. Um, and I think it's a, it's a useful and helpful example um, because of the versatility and improvisational character of uh, these regimes and the ways in which new forms of, um, you know, of bordering and uh, new forms of border policing are kind of always being introduced. Um, uh, with Martina Tazzioli, I, I wrote a paper called Kidnapping Migrants as a, as a tactic of border enforcement. Um, and part of what we discussed there is precisely the ways in which refusing to allow ships uh, that had uh, ships with migrants or uh, refugees, um, refusing to allow them to, to enter Italian ports meant that they were effectively detained. Um, at sea for prolonged periods of time. And we frame that as, as a form of kidnapping um, alongside other examples where the state has become more and more aggressive and uh, invested in um, the exertion of a form of power that literally, that literally resembles, um, you know, sort of uh, abducting people against their will, depriving them of their liberty. Of course, there are resemblances between any form of detention or imprisonment with, um, with some of these points, but then it's useful to also understand how some of these then become uh, forms of indefinite abduction, uh, including mobile forms of abduction, such as uh, a boat at sea where people are trapped. Um, and where that the capacity of those people to escape um, is precluded uh, in part by the mobilization of uh, the geography itself, in this case, the sea. Um, so you have, you have a whole variety of these interesting new kinds of examples whereby, you know, at one level we see you know, plainly devious and violent uh, examples of flagrant state abuse um, toward migrants and refugees. Um, but we also need to sort of try to understand what do they represent at the level of the reconfiguration of power and new deployments of power, um, and how do they sort of in instruct us about transformations in bordering itself. Um, so, you know, so maybe that's just a kind of short way to answer that one. Uh, it's related, I guess, to um, the question about infrastructures of immobility or immobilization. Um, because of course we tend to think of, uh, we tend to think of um, uh, detention on the model of something that resembles a prison camp or, uh, you know, kind of an actual set of walls and, uh, you know, and buildings where people are uh, immobilized uh, coercively in one place. But um, but part of what I was trying to develop, and it builds upon work by uh, by Martina Tazzioli and others, is is this concept of containing people without confining people. 
That is to say, not necessarily trapping them in a prison, putting them in a detention camp, but in fact, containing them in their own mobility by various kinds of blockage and rerouting um, that then imply new spatial configurations, but also uh, forms of temporal bordering whereby people's, uh, people become entrapped in border zones or spaces of transit in ways that, um, you know, that decelerate their mobilities, as I was emphasizing, in ways that uh, effectively contain their mobilities for prolonged periods of time, but without necessarily uh, directly laying hands by state agents on their bodies, depriving them of their liberty, putting them in cages, et cetera, right? So we have the classic model of detention, but we have a whole variety of new configurations of the ways in which states are engaged in forms of, um, you know, forms of, of um, detention, uh, you know, so to speak of detention in a broader sense, um, forms of intervention into the, into the sort of zones of mobility um, that, that reconfigure the different ways in which bordering is operating. And again, that's where um, the, the, the concept of kidnapping becomes useful, right? Um, what happens when Europe authorizes Libyan coast guards to actually drag a boat back to Libya um, in the name of uh, some kind of bilateral agreement between the EU and Libya or particular EU member states and Libya uh, in order to police the European border, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, and so we, we have the example of, of Greece dragging people's boats back into Turkish waters and dumping them there. We also have the example of the EU authorizing and commissioning Libyan coast guards to drag people back to Libya uh, and indeed put them then at risk of incredible uh, violence and exploitation there. Um, so again, so then it becomes, then you begin to sort of see some of these dynamics more as kidnapping, right? And I think that's part of what is partly at stake when people are trapped, for example, in, in a ferry boat. Um, the, um, I mean, the, the question about um, the contradictions of solidarity is a big one. Uh, I would refer the questioner to a new book by one of my former PhD students, uh, Fiorenzo Picozza, called The Coloniality of Asylum, which was just published in February. Um, Picozza, P-I-C-O-Z-Z-A. Um, and indeed that's the centerpiece, you know, the central question of that study, which was based on research in Hamburg during the height of the so-called migrant or refugee crisis. Um, what was at stake in the various forms of uh, either volunteerism in the spirit of charity and humanitarianism or activist solidarity when people responded to the, arrival, the mass arrival of new migrants and, and refugees in the center of Europe. Um, but, uh, but indeed, I mean, so there is always this kind of danger of, um, of a kind of white savior complex at the same time, there are sort of dire questions at stake about what would it mean to engage in a meaningful practice of solidarity? What do we mean by solidarity as such um, in these contexts? Um, so that's not really an answer, but it, it, it is a way to acknowledge it that I think that's a very important question. And then finally, these, um, these other two questions, um, I mean, uh, there are a variety of important historical uh, resemblances or, or analogies or indeed continuities between colonialism and slavery and contemporary border policing. Um, detention is only one piece of that larger puzzle. Um, but, um, but I think that, I mean, it's a, it's a huge question where we could take it in many directions. I would really love to have the opportunity to ask the person posing the question um, to say more about, about, again, the question behind the question, so to speak. Um, but one of the things that I would sort of introduce is the proposition that for me, um, slavery in particular, which of course had a variety of different manifestations or uh, 
forms in the colonial context uh, was formative of our capitalist modernity. It's constitutive. Um, and indeed, as I argue in a different part of my work, it's, it's really the ultimate limit figure through which to understand labor as such under capitalism. That is to say, not that all labor is slavery, but that all labor is pressed to approximate and approach slavery because slavery was ultimately the, 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 the most perfect manifestation of a regime that reduced human life to labor and nothing but labor that diminished and demeaned and degraded human life to the point where human life was reduced completely in an abject sense to labor and nothing but labor and was perfectly disposable, eminently disposable, right? So um, if we think about slavery in that sense as the kind of limit figure through which to understand all labor, then, you know, then we see that it has a permanent resonance and, and relevance for how we understand social relations in the world today, uh, how we understand our contemporary post-colonial world economy as one that is inseparable and inextricable from that long legacy of hundreds of years of colonialism. Um, and again, that means that it's impossible from my point of view to look at borders, to look at migrant detention, to look at deportation, and this variety of different forms of power, this economy of power around bordering and migration and human mobility in a way that is somehow extracted or removed from that larger context, which is about capitalism, but an acknowledgement that capitalism is always colonial capitalism, that capitalism is always racial capitalism. Um, so I guess that's a, an attempt to give a short answer to a very big question. Um, and then I'm very, you know, I think it's, I think it's a very exciting question to think about the example um, of of border zones or border regions that historically have always been interconnected, where people are connected on both sides through relations of kinship, through relations of community, through long-standing historical relations, um, and uh, and then have come in the context of post-colonial. Uh, the, the post-colonial universalization of the nation state as the modular uh, universal form of, of, uh, of political sovereignty, to they've come to be bordered, right? So that's part of what the era of decolonization has given us. And, um, and here I'm sort of thinking also of uh, Nandita Sharma's important um, work, uh, the book Home Rule that just came out, uh, about a year and a half ago or so, um, where the era of decolonization represents the rise of a kind of post-colonial governmentality whereby the nation state becomes the universal ubiquitous modular form for political sovereignty. It means that now we have a world where there are more borders than ever before and where indeed borders were drawn where they had never been. And, um, you know, and in a world that previously had been dominated by global empires uh, you know, of European or Euro-American provenance, we now have a world more crisscrossed by borders than ever before. And of course, those borders are all inherently uh, artificial ones. So it means that these questions about sites where people who historically are connected uh, and related um, across the two sides of a border you know, are, are abundant everywhere. Um, and what they remind us is uh, something that I like to cite—a slogan of the of the of the Mexican uh, of the Mexican American or Chicano liberation struggles of the 1960s and 70s. The slogan that came to be prominent is "We didn't cross the border; the border crossed us." Right, and that refers indeed to uh, the U.S. war of annexation, uh, an imperialist war of aggression instigated by the U.S. in a purely cynical way to take what was basically half of Mexico and turn it into what we think of today as the Southwest of the United States, extending basically from Texas to California. All of that had previously been Mexico and a border was drawn where there never had been one. So this, this border that has such a fetishized importance in our imaginations on a global scale, when we think about these questions, 
particularly of uh, so-called illegal migration, um, this U.S.-Mexico border was indeed a border drawn across a region that had previously all been Mexico. The other side of which, of course, is that it subjected the, that newly colonized population of Mexicans in the north to U.S. power. Um, but it, but again, it, it takes the form of expression 150 years later of, you know, we never crossed the border, the border crossed us. Um, and that indeed is instructive in my point of view, because that's true for all of us. It's not only true of particular communities of, uh, you know, particularly racially subjugated or colonized groups. It's true of citizens as well as non-citizens. It's true of everyone. We've all been bordered because that's what it means to be a citizen. And it's also what it means, obviously, to be a non-citizen. Um, so maybe that's a good place where we can stop. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, uh, for this very um, elaborate and uh, uh, responses. And then I think that the, um, thank you very much for your uh, questions, for your great questions. I will just add to this kind of the infrastructures of the immobility in a way that kind of spatial spatial legal variegated spatial legal apparatuses in a way that produces and reproduces those kinds of containments so i think that the uh, i mean see uh, the example that uh, the um Mugge was giving is i think it is not arbitrary in that sense which had a very different kind of a legal standing uh, even without making legal legalities as a fetishism and i think it's a great point to stop with the kind of the slogan that the borders having crossed that we have. I mean, not only really, I think in Mexico and also Eastern Europe or Central Europe that the borders have crossed, but actually this is how the citizens are made and unmade. That, that uh, this is how, uh, um, the citizens are uh, produced, and I think this is a good place to uh, end with the with the note of the uh, um, the coloniality of capitalism. Capitalism works only with the uh, coloniality is so crucial for capitalism, not simply as the kind of the colonial formations. That's why I think it's very valuable the way that you expanded and reached out and respond to those questions. Thank you very much again, uh, Mick, and thank you very much for all your uh, uh, questions and for your participation. And uh, as, I, as usual, I keep saying, uh, keep following us. In uh, May, we will have Nargis Jennifer from uh, Canada uh, as, as our uh, speaker for the uh, forced migration seminar series and forced migration is it is not another it's a kind of a label just a kind of a trying to have a, a harmless label knowing that there is no harmless there is no label which is harmless itself thank you very much Nick thank you very much for all of you Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.